Hi, welcome to my video. I'm so glad you found the thumbnail interesting. Before we get into today's video, uh, Family Man, the review, and full story, I just wanted to give a quick clarification that some of the audio won't match up with the video exactly. Instead of this playthrough where my husband's name is Alfredo, it's Pee Pee Poo Poo on the video, and my son's name isn't Alfredito, it's Poo Poo Pee Pee. That is because there are multiple endings in Family Man and I decided to mash up all my recorded footage for the playthrough just to give the best narrative experience while playing. Um, so yeah, just imagine my wife's name in this playthrough is Alfredo, and not Poo Poo Pee Pee, which you will see me type. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video, it took a while to make, um, thank you so much for tuning in, and yeah. Hi, my name is Gideon, Gids to my homies, and I play games, but also other stuff. Today it's games, tomorrow insurance fraud. Who knows, the possibilities are endless. This kind of brings us into the game we'll be talking about today though, Family Man. Family Man the game, not the highly successful Indian web series. Oh, but then me, but a drastic change hua hoga, na? I never see you at any activities in the office. Was released in May of 2020 during the midst of the pandemic. And boy, would that have been a good excuse to have even looked in the direction of this game. I came across this odd title while browsing the Steam sale list, I assume, because there's no way I paid 20 big ones for this jazz. Well, now, I don't mean to brag. Oh, I was just a regular type dude with a big ass dick. But I would say I am the leading player expert on this game. I have 50 hours of playtime plus several hours of research trying to find answers to questions I had for this video. To add context, No More Robots, the developers of this game, posted a guide on how to get all four endings on their YouTube, but did not show all four endings. Just kind of told you about the embodiments, as I'll come to call them. Those are your antagonists. Before I go further, I wanted to say thank you to all my recent subscribers. I know my content is catered towards what I want to make, but the niche for cool and non-problematic people on the internet seems to be catching on, so it may be my time to shine. 300 strong, babies! Back to Family Man. Now before you dismiss it as some off-brand Family Guy Minecraft clone, give it a chance, as it's got some charming moments from the get-go. And no crafting. As with all games I review, there are needlessly complicated endings and character developments, but seeing as how I broke down Road 92 like that, I think we'll just go chronological this time. Starting from the epilogue, you gain consciousness in the parking lot of a pretty decent bar, possibly even sentience. Your name is Joe Hawthorne, and your friend Bobby No Last Name alerts you that a fight is occurring, and you are the other combatant. You assumingly win the fight because otherwise you stand there an immortal and endless purgatory. And I'm just not about that life. Once you dispose of this vagrant and walk away without seeking medical attention for the man you've knocked unconscious, to rendezvous with Bobby. Bobby says, let's continue to the bar and drink this encounter away. Once inside the establishment and chatting with Bobby, he suggests you go and try to close the deal with the potential suitor you had been talking with earlier. This is the player's first choice, as you get to pick your boo for the rest of your playthrough. You also get to name them when they ask if you remember their name. I named my husband Alfredo. I also think your spouse is what the appearance of your child is based on, or it could be a randomly generated color palette. Once you've selected your lucky candidate, you realize nature calls, and you must take a little tinkle winkle. Inside the bathroom, Joe relieves himself, and once the fly is zipped, Bobby is at the doorway in a tuxedo. You're at your wedding, congrats! Once you make it to the altar and tell your SO of your choosing that you did write the vows they asked for, but you did leave them inside. Once making your way inside to the other building, you discover you are now in a hospital and your baby boy, girl, or non-binary child has just been born. It's time for you to get to name them. Mm. I named my son Alfredito after his father. Once you just experienced the happiest days of your life in a matter of seconds, hit the fast forward button, I believe we're sometime at your conception. 
Okay, very good, Miss. You walk through a hallway out of the hospital into a Christmas party. This is Bobby's Christmas party, and he has a proposition. Bobby has been in contact with a shady figure by the name of Delroy, and he wants us to upload a virus or something undetected to steal millions of dollars from the company Joe and Bobby work at. In exchange, Bobby says Delroy is more than willing to take care of Joe's financial troubles, which are implied in a conversation Joe had earlier with his spouse. Cut to the elevator doors opening, and we're at the office. We make our way back to the office server rooms and begin uploading Delroy's virus as planned. However, the day after Joe uploads the virus, he is called into his boss's office. They know what he's been doing to the company's servers and are now going to fire him. On our way out, after packing up all of our things, we run into a character who will be relevant later in the story, Bert. Bert says to Joe, we can't all be winners, and you can either tell him to sh or just kind of take it for no reason, you pussy. Bobby says thanks for not selling him out too, and you're on your way out the elevator. We come to a mysterious complex of sorts, where we're greeted by a man claiming his name to be Bruce. Oh, he really doesn't mean it, you know, he never even knew his father! Don't pull up. Bruce will be our immortal overseer for the next three weeks, as you'll come to find out. You've been sent to meet Bruce by Bobby after the virus upload failed. Bruce says Bobby's running late, but in the meantime, how about some target practice? After a perfect bullseye, Bruce says that's enough, and he and Joe can go back to his office now. When we go back to Bruce's office, we find the body of Bobby, sitting in the chair behind the glass target we just shot. In other words, we just executed Bobby. Bruce tells us to sit down and to shut up, because he's going to do the talking. Here's the thing, Delroy, Bruce's employer, is not happy about how everything went with the virus upload. Now Delroy expects Joe to pay him back for the damages the failed upload has caused. Joe, over three weeks, will pay back the money in ever-increasing demands. How Joe gets the money isn't of any concern to Bruce or Delroy, but that the money is paid by midnight each day. Joe will do this for three weeks, and Delroy will call it square, on one condition. Fridays are for them. Every Friday, Joe will have to go out and complete a job with Bruce. What that job is, is often nefarious. Weekends are for Joe. With the term set, the Family Man game can now begin. On the first day, the player is given an easy go of things. After waking up, you're greeted by Alfredo, who says that their broken wrist is still giving them trouble, and they would appreciate it if you could do some chores around the house. Get used to this because you'll be doing quite a lot of these. Now the actual jobs aren't time consuming or even that tedious, but staying on top of them will slip your mind throughout the middays, which is where cleanliness begins to take a downward spiral. Chores include doing the dishes, laundry, weeding, and even killing three rats over and over again in your basement with a bat named Old Something or Other. These jobs will take an in-game 45 minutes in total to complete. Time stays still during your stay in the house. Once you knock out these little jobs, your cleanliness level will raise, keeping your family happy and healthy, but not fed. More on that later. You can gain some quick points every morning by brushing your teeth. Once you make it outside, Bruce is there and gives you the rundown on the 20-day payment plan I had mentioned earlier. On the first day, you owe $50, which Bruce explains that we can take side jobs for him, either delivering unmarked packages to locations A and B, or beating targeted people up for him. In other words, just being a hitman, because I thought you beat them up, but it turns out you actually just, like, kill them. So, uh, yeah. It pays 100 bucks. It's official day one. On day one, you can make your way down to the city square, as I like to call it, where the player can choose to interact with two NPCs. A fast food employee looking to hire your services, and then some, or a gentleman who is looking to purchase any garbage you may find. Starting with the fast food employee, he wants you to work a shift, but there's more. You can steal money from the registers and spit in people's food. Why would you spit in people's food? Well, let me give you the breakdown. This this dude hates the people he serves, and his job so much, he'll take money from his minimum wage job to pay you $2 for each burger you spit in. Now you can't just go spitting in burgers willy-nilly, there are cameras, and every time you get caught you have to pay a $10 fee. No karma backlash though. Oh, did I not mention the karma system of Family Man? Family Man has a karma system, with real effects. When your karma is up, Yay! there are rainbows and the town is overall cleaner and better. When your karma is down, you must engage with robbers like every five feet that impede your progress significantly. It pays to be good, way more than it does to be evil. Kind of. Uh, you get, you get more time being good, you get more money being evil, if I had to say. 
Do enough of these shifts and you can work your way up through promotions to rack in some serious cash, but you have to be fast and not get caught spitting, you llama. After your shift at the burger place, which takes three hours of the day every time, we make our way over to the man who was offering to buy our trash. He would like for us to go obtain trash to sell him. Junk, as the game calls it, can be obtained in a multitude of fashions. Trash cans have private documents, and there's a monetary system based on the color of flowers. P.S. Gold is worth 15 is the highest paying. To even praying to God that a bottle of reserved spirits worth $100 pops up from punching crates on the beach, so that Bruce won't kill you and your entire family. But it's already 10 p.m., so you're cutting your losses. Yeah, collecting junk is complicated, and the player can go the entirety of the game by only collecting junk. There's even a perk that increases the percentage of the worth for each item sold by 2%. After the completion of the sale, you pay Bruce and you're pretty much left up to your own devices. I went around and punched crates looking for a bottle to get a leg up in the week. At 8pm though, you better make sure your ass is home because Junior wants a bedtime story and it will destroy your family's happiness level if you decide to go back out after you've tucked in your kid. I should mention there is a car wash where the player can obtain money legitimately, but punching crates is far more entertaining, so that's what I chose to do a lot of the time. Alrighty, this, this, you gotta keep this part a secret between us, like, I, this is a big glitch in the game and is only available on day one, but if you leave the house, which you should have no reason to do on the first day, you'll have infinite time for the night. What that means is that you can go down to the beach, punch a bunch of crates, get bottles and wood and nails or whatever, and then go back to the junk guy, sell all that, go into your house and leave again, and the clock will have been the same time, meaning you have an infinite amount of real-world time to go in and, like, grind loot, or not loot, but, like, just money, you know? And at the same time, there's a, uh, you can talk to people, and, you know, it's just insane. So if you want to, like, cheese the game, this is a really great way to do it. But if you don't, you go to sleep and your family is really happy that you stayed inside, but that doesn't matter because happiness isn't a thing yet. <laughs> Moving on. Day two. From this point on, just imagine I've already done my daily chores because if you don't do them, you die. Your family levels are just as important as being able to pay the funds needed to pay off Bruce. So with that said, I'll skip that detail from every day from now on. So just imagine I did my chores before leaving the house. When we first wake up, just like on day one, our mission from our SO was chores. Today it's food. How dare they have basic needs, but as a merciful provider, we aim to please. Bars. Exiting the house, we begin to look for work, which takes us to Kyle. Before moving forward, I need to explain some things. Remember those embodiments I had? Well, these are them. I wish I had someone explain to me this when I was playing the first time. In these games, the antagonists are subvert, but in so many words, Kyle is an antagonist. Anyone who's about to ask you for any lengthy type of work is an antagonist. Also, they're meant to represent the personification of sin, the seven deadly sins to be exact. If you need a full metal alchemist refresher, the seven deadly sins are pride, greed, I summon what Pot of Greed to draw three greed. additional cards from my deck! That's not what it does. Roll my dice! That is what it does! Pot of Greed! Draw three! I summon Pot of Greed! Wrath, Sloth, Lust, Envy, and Gluttony. In the case of Kyle, he is the personification of Sloth. Sloth, for my low vocab viewers, is being a lazy shit. Kyle is that lazy shit, and he has a job for us. Kyle grows carrots. More of his mother grows carrots, but not important. In his backyard and notice he's got some furry friends eating his crops. Kyle gives Joe the choice of catching the rabbits in a cage, or other words, alive, or the player can go back and hit them all with a bat, killing them in one hit. It is up to the player to make the obvious choice between good and evil. I've done both, but only because I didn't see the cage was an option until my second playthrough. The choice you will make will determine the respective karma you gain. Kyle will give you the money once the rabbits are dealt with, and you can go on to terrorize the next town. Next up on our journey to not die, we find ourselves talking to a man who will only tell us that he's an author, and that his manuscript was well on its way, only to be blown away by the wind. And it's up to Joe, you, to track down all 30 pages. It was only on my last playthrough I was able to find all 30, which was super worth it. No really, it was. Can't elaborate further, but it was. You will be given your entire playthrough to find all 30 pages, and if you follow the natural route of character jobs, you should see them and pick them up with no problem. 
I'll, uh, I'll link a guide in the description down below. We make our way back to the town, where we can choose to talk to Lawrence. Lawrence, as you soon will find out, is the personification of lust. Today, Lawrence wants us to go talk to Sally, a barista at the coffee shop. We head on over there and wait in line to talk to Sally. There, we lie and tell her we're from corporate to do an employee survey. Through this ruse, we are able to discover Sally has an interest in acting. We head to Lawrence and tell him private information from Sally, and he pays us. We leave confident this won't grow into anything bigger. Lastly, on day two, Maggie needs your help. Who the hell is Maggie, you may ask? Well, despite my rule that anyone asking help is a primordial sin, Maggie's different. She's Bobby's, the guy you killed, widow, and she's wondering if you could help her hang up missing posters for Bobby. What are you gonna do, say no? You'd have to be some kind of sick freak to tell her no. So after hanging up the posters, we bust our ass to make it to the burger joint for our shift, uh, three hours, let me remind you, before also racing home to pay Bruce and tuck in the kiddo. We finish out day two by staying in like a good family man. Woo, day two complete. Day three. Our spouse greets us as they do every morning with the daily needs, just like in real life. And today the kid is sick and needs meds. Make sure you get the small health gain from the pharmacy because the large won't be accepted. You leave the house and make your way down the road to the first job of the day. This, like Maggie, is another one-off job that doesn't embody sin. Female farmer character, she doesn't have a name, I swear, asks Joe to help a male local ranch owner up the street. We make our way up to the ranch and talk to the ranch owner who reveals that he has a problem. He needs help picking between two love interests, Jesse and Bessie. Despite their similar names, they are drastically different. The player must pick between Jesse and Bessie, I can't remember which is either. The two options between the girls, however, are crass and kind of a bitch with brunette hair at the unnamed female farmer's farm, or the blonde girl who is a business owner and sweet. The choice made by the player character doesn't have any effect on the karma system or ending, so it's up to you. After we finish playing matchmaker, we take a visit to Kyle, who is still having rabbit problems. Kyle asks if you can track down the prince and see if you can hunt down the rabbit mama. Kyle, remember, is the embodiment of sloth, so he's going to ask you to do jobs because he hates doing anything. Once we track down the big rabbit, we can either let it go or kill it for me in evil karma. Once your choice is made, we return to Kyle to let him know we finished the job and move on with our day. Day three is full, so I'll be going fast. After Kyle's whole thing, we continue making our way to the town square. On the way, we find the town sheriff, who surprisingly has a job for us. The sheriff would like for us to go steal lemons from a church. Why lemons, you ask? Well, the sheriff is a self-labeled foodie and would do anything to get his hands on those flavorful lemons. This struck me as odd because a foodie would probably know what lemons taste like. We accept, though, because we owe money to the mob, and make our way over to the church. There at the tree, a priest is tending to his lemons. I tried just like, you know, on my evil run beating the shit out of him and stealing the lemons, but I couldn't figure out how to do that, so we gotta talk to him. After being honest, he'll just give you the lemons, because, you know, that's how that works. And, uh, yeah, you, you take the lemons and you head back to the sheriff's cruiser, you put them in the trunk, and the job is complete. If you can't already tell, the sheriff is the embodiment of gluttony and one of the primary antagonists throughout the game. Finally making it to the town square after solving everyone's problems but our own, we are interrupted once again by the mayor's bodyguard. The mayor would like to speak to us privately. After going very far out of the way, we manage to engage the mayor. The mayor is trying to build a factory. Where this factory is to be located is already occupied by Grace, an older woman, an artist of the town. We pay a visit to Grace, flinging ourselves from the mayor's mansion as there's no fall damage. Once at Grace's house, we tell her what the mayor told us. She, of course, doesn't want to sell her house. This leaves the player with two options, one good, the other evil. The player can fake Grace's signature by visiting the completed work she did a year prior, its two boats on the beach. Or the player can go back to the mayor and do what everyone does when land development is impending and lie. That's right, Joe can go back to the mayor and tell him that the land that Grace's house is on is sinking, and that the development of his fish factory is not advised. If the player does end up faking Grace's signature, then an ugly ass factory will be present where her cozy house once stood, but Grace will move in with the old man across the street, which is kind of sweet. If you haven't made the deduction already, then that's right, the mayor is the antagonist of greed. After the mayor, I see what jobs we may have left on my map, and head back down to the town square. 
Oh no, I took a wrong turn, and No Good <laughs> Vagrant once again says that if I don't pay him $20 of my recently hard-earned cash for some rotting food, he's going to kick my butt. This encounter is a little deeper than it may seem. We the player can either ask the man why he has turned to such a pitiful life through a series of dialogue options, or beat him up. Karma has been affected accordingly. Moving on! So you know how I know more about the Family Man game than anyone else? Well here's my proof. In Family Man, a character wearing outdoor gear by the name of Crosley will appear on the third day. Crosley is an antagonist, but I for the life of me cannot say his sin. I know he's a sin and he's not just a one-off character because every time you complete his quest, you take a karma hit. Let me explain. If anyone could find any information about a walkthrough on Crosley's missions, you are a better person than I. Crosley has consistent work for you up until the very last day. Crosley gives Joe the task of slaying the beast and escalating danger. So basically, he's a scientist, a hunter, whatever you want to call him, and he wants you to go around killing animals for science, and today, the player, you are tasked with straight up killing three ducks. To my knowledge, there is no way around this. You can't go find replacements for him, you just have to do it. It will affect your karma negatively, I think he might be wrath. You don't have to worry about your family's happiness until day four. By the time of day three, however, you're probably scarce on time. How, once you're done with Crosley shenanigans on animal abuse, you will have no time left before bedtime. Run home, tuck your kid in, and then leave, because if you leave at night and the happiness of your family nosedives, it won't affect anything. You could do this for the first two days, like I said earlier with that cheat, but the only reason to do this is to grind junk and get ahead for the week, and you'll just have to justify it morally in your own head since like there's no negative consequences. The only reason I did it on day three was to go work a shift at the burger place, then went straight home to start day four. So up until day three, you don't have to worry about your family's happiness, which will become a bar on day four. But by the time of day three, however, you'll probably be scarce on time once you're done with Crosley shenanigans of animal abuse. Uh, so you run home, tuck your kid in, and then leave because once you leave, it has no negative effect on your happiness. It won't affect anything. You could do this for the first two days, like I said, and you'll have infinite time on the first day because of a glitch. Um, that's up to you. Uh, if you want to have the full Family Man experience, just like don't leave on the first like three days, I would say. Just keep working on the the McDonald's down the street. The only reason I did it for day three was to go work a shift at the burger place. So then I went straight home to start day four because the time does resume. Uh, so you, you, you'll pass out at midnight. Either way, it's not important. Um, oh, also, if you pass out in your house, you're, you're chilling. Uh, it doesn't matter. So like the only way you could do this is by doing chores while you, it's like 1130. Day four, though. Before leaving the house, our child has a job for us, and he's willing to pay, so that's kind of fucked up. At some point today, if we could locate some cardboard for our kid to make himself a cool monster costume, that would be some grade-A dad shit. We leave the house and run to our first job. It's the sheriff. The sheriff has another craving and would like for us to obtain a pie from Old Man Murray. The sheriff has been an unable to obtain said pie because of a dog that Old Man Murray has. The player character has two choices in this case. The good is we buy the pie for $50 and then just deliver it. The bad choice is if we give Murray's dog a bone, which we steal the pie right in front of him. The bone can be found in, you know, trash cans or even in his backyard, so they kind of set it up for you. Take the pie back to Sheriff and wipe your hands of the whole mess and move on. Next is Lawrence. Lawrence wants us to head down to the town theater to get more info on Sally. We go to the theater where Sally needs a rehearsal partner. You volunteer. Doing a wee bit of viral marketing. <laughs> <laughs> I tell the tale of Sweeney Todd. He served a dark and avenged God. There is no bad or good choice in this job. The player can say the lines right or wrong. It doesn't matter. Return to Lawrence. Bada bing, that's two. We'll have so much free time today. Next up is a new antagonist, Bert. Bert, if you remember correctly, is your old co-worker who you told to either shove it or just kind of let you, you know, you, you pussed out. You'll, you let him call. He, he said you weren't a winner, but you find out he also got canned because of probably obvious reasons and is out on the street without a job. Bert has decided to start his own business selling hats and sunglasses, I think. Bert is the embodiment of pride or vanity. 
Bert is launching his new marketing camp. Bert, 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 Bert. Bert is launching his new marketing campaign and needs Joe to go hang up a billboard. Joe makes his way onto the roof and does it lickety split. Return to Bert, 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 Bert. Return to Bert to get the bank. Now go to work a shift at the burger joint. Get paid, get a promotion, and go home. The house is clean and everyone is fed, so I decided to take advantage of the newly placed board game that's on the dining room table. The finale of the board game leaves Joe with three options that we get to pick from. Let the kid win for happiness, let your spouse win for experience, or let yourself win for a lot of experience but a decrease in happiness. After the board game where I let my kid win, it was bedtime. I tucked the little monster in, told him a story, and stayed in for the night as I crushed the work week. Day 5, aka Friday. Now if you remember what I said at the beginning of the video, that on Fridays we work for Bruce, so that's what we're going to do. Once leaving the house, the player is immediately transported to the diner by the lake, but for now, it's just the diner. Joe receives a phone call taking out his cell. It's Bruce. He's going to give you the rundown on what we're doing here. Joe is informed that a man sitting at a booth alone is a journalist and is about to release a story on Delroy that would cast a less than favorable light on him and his group. Joe takes a seat at the booth and begins trying to convince the journalist, enlightening the writer on the threat to his life and the associated risk. The journalist won't hear it and informs Joe the story is going to run regardless of what Joe has to say. The journalist excuses himself to the restroom. Joe receives another call from Bruce. Joe informs Bruce that the journalist will continue to run the story on Delroy. Bruce is not happy about the situation and informs Joe that his next task is to cause a disturbance in the diner. Joe makes his way to the front counter and can say pretty much anything as long as he causes a scene. Once a scene is caused and then de-escalated, Joe makes his way to the restroom to find Bruce there. The bathroom is covered in blood. Bruce says that Joe did a good job with the distraction and the journalist will no longer be of any concern. Bruce tells Joe to pick up the journalist's phone and send out the story on either the current mayor or the new mayoral candidate. Obvious karma choice here is the mayoral candidate is like a halfway decent guy. Once a story on either person is sent out, Bruce tells Joe to clean up the bathroom with a nearby mop and that they're done for the day. Clean up the bathroom and make your way out of the diner, and Joe and his family may now enjoy the undisturbed weekend together. Congrats, you're an accessory to murder. Yay! It's day 8 when we made it through the first week without a snag, but now a new area is available since we went to the diner at the lake, and therefore, new and challenging jobs, even from our own family. The kiddo, before we even leave the house, is asked if we are willing to put together an outdoor playset that our brother-in-law has purchased for them as a gift. We put it together poorly, I might add, which you can't ever assemble correctly. Leaving the house, we begin to go on our hunt for work, which takes us to several people, starting with the sheriff. The sheriff needs us to recover some evidence from a crime scene to progress an ongoing serial killer investigation. We accept and go to the lake location. We run deep into the woods through wolves until we find a maimed corpse. We grab one of the legs. P.S. It looks as though a bear was responsible. That may be because the bear showed up after the fact. The sheriff, unlike in previous retrieval jobs, has Joe go to a private storage locker this time. Upon entering, we are immediately taken back. The sheriff is cooking human remains in a large pot, and you immediately begin to question the apparent cannibal. The sheriff begins bargaining with you, offering you complete illegal immunity in exchange for your silence. You can either deal with the cannibal and dispose of him in self-defense, or accept his offer and be on your merry way. This is the end of the gluttony slash sheriff storyline, but not the day. The immunity that the sheriff is offering is worth it if you're going for the uh, evil ending, but if you're not, then it's not really worth it. I've killed people out right in front of him and then been charged with zero hours of jail time or a zero like dollar fee. So it, it's worth it if you're going for the evil storyline, which I'll get more into at the end of the video. Bert, our old coworker and somehow new boss, needs us to go see what the holdup is with his new sign that oversees the city. When Joe makes his way up to the sign, he finds that all the construction workers are sleeping or daydreaming. It's up to Joe to make sure the workers wake up and resume progress. Once Joe wakes up the construction crew, the player is given the choice of proceeding with the initial plan of having Bert be the word, or the player can choose to scratch this and write any four letter word of their choosing. So like poop or shit or be nice or like just nice, I guess. This is a little different from the other jobs, as if you leave Bert as the planned word, you will receive the so-called bad ending for this character. When it comes to Bert, additionally, I can't remember if it affects your karma, but I believe so. Before heading home and paying our debt, we the player see that Kyle needs us for another job. Kyle's mother needs three blueberries to make the signature moonshine she's accustomed to. We run up to the nearby waterfall to gather said blueberries and return to Kyle. 
I said fuck work at the burger joint and stayed in for the night, paying Bruce. Day 9. Wake up in ball per usual. We exit the house and see someone who needs help at the neighbor's farm. It's the male farmer, presumable husband of an unnamed female farmer we had helped earlier. The farmer requires someone to help him and find his inheritance. The inheritance is given in the form of a treasure hunt with a series of clues. They're all located either in or around the central river and waterfall that runs through the town, and overall not that interesting. After bringing the farmer the treasure he sent us out for, we head to the beach as a new antagonist has a job for us, Star. Star is the embodiment of the sin Envy, as she is especially envious of another influencer. To boost her views, we need to beat up some douchebags on the beach so Star can record it and gain clout. World Star. There's no way around this, so you just gotta kick their asses. Return to Star and she'll tell you good job and give you some money. Head up to the manor to see our favorite politician, the mayor this time instead of waiting for anything in life wants us to commit a small breaking and entering on the car dealership outside his house. My mammy. Hey, mammy! Oh, don't be like that. If I had a rock, I'd bust your head, bitch. Say, man, she deaf, you know? <laughs> he would like for us to place his name not only on one waitlist, but on the top of the waitlist, no less. You can gain access to the dealership safe with the waitlist by taking the hint the salesman gives you and taking each underlined number of the listed priced cars and entering them from highest to lowest. This combination will open the safe and you can make your exit back to the mayor. Cash in and get away. No moral choices to be made here. Easy day. Only three jobs, we head back and call it a day. Day 10. Brush your teeth and hit the town. They ain't ready for Joe. Making our first stop at Lawrence, who you'll remember is Lust. Turns out Sally has a boyfriend and Lawrence isn't okay with that. Joe needs us to head over to the mechanic shop Sally's boyfriend works at. Now we can deal with this in two ways. Both seem bad to me, but one is worse than the other. Joe can tell Sally's soon-to-be ex that she's cheating on him, causing him to leave her. Or you can press the poorly placed kill switch on the outside of the garage, causing the engine he's working on to fall in and kill him. Uh, seems pretty poorly placed, like what if someone like leans against the wall and like, oh no. Uh, return to Lawrence and let him know his love interest is now single, uh, either because you know you killed him or Head to the lake because Crosley needs us to go and get some wolf teeth. We say no biggie and go kill a wolf through a series of well-placed punches. Call it a day. Day 11. Crosley this time wants us to go kill the strongest enemy in the game, a goat at the top of a mountain. Keep in mind there are bears and other things that are way more dangerous as you'll come to find out, but I stand with my statement of saying the goat is stronger. If you play the game, you'll know what I mean. Star or Envy, as you remember, is dedicated to hijacking the Wi-Fi signals to promote her content even more so. It's up to Joe to go find three of these routers and enter the nearby corresponding codes to take them over. Report back to Star and move on with your day. Next up is Kyle. He asks if you can go to the pharmacy to grab his mother's medicine and slip it in her drink. You could do that, or you could put it in his moonshine that you clearly made for him with the blueberries. The moonshine is the good ending, mother's drink is the evil. You'll find out soon enough. Run home and call it good. A lot of these tasks sort of repeat themselves, and writing this I had to go back and play like 6 more hours of content to get every story related achievement. My enthusiasm waned at the 20 hour mark, and I'm now on 60. Day 12. Day 12 is a Friday, which means we work with Bruce. He tells us we're needed at the hospital for some serious business. We leave the house and are transported to the hospital courtyard, where Bruce informs us of some difficulties with a union rep who controls the ships in the harbor. We need to convince the union rep that would be in his best interest to accommodate Delroy's plans. We sneak into the hospital by either paying a nurse for a uniform or knocking him out and just taking one. Once inside the hospital, we sneak into the room through a window. We inform the rep of his current situation. An interesting development occurs where we can take a payoff and leave the man alive saying to Bruce that there were complications, but more or less that he's okay and he's not gonna change. Or like I said, kill him by raising the sedative with the equipment the rep is hooked up to. Be careful the buttons are broken and can go out the window. Jump off the ledge we used to sneak in and bada bing we crimestas. Thus concludes our Friday with Bruce. We kick off the weekend with some possible murders and enjoy Saturday and Sunday with the fam. Day 15. We wake up happy it's our last day of owing money and leave the house with a new perspective on life. Hey, remember those pills we bought for Kyle, aka Sloth? Well, depending whose drink you put it in, we killed them. 
So now there is a funeral being held at the church for either Kyle or his mother. This is the end of the Sloth storyline. If you killed Kyle's mother, congrats, you got the evil ending. If you killed Kyle, I guess you got the good ending. Killing Kyle's mother will result in him opening up a fish and liquor store where the fish is rotting and the liquor is not available for sale. <laughs> Making our way to the farm, we take on the third treasure hunt. It's in a log behind the House of Grace, the artist's signature we possibly forged for the mayor. Next, we go to talk to Bert, who wants to rub in our face the success or failure of his business we either made or broke. To my belief, he sells sunglasses primarily now, but who knows? For our efforts, he'll give us some money, and thus concludes the Pride storyline. On the beach, Star would like some surgery done to keep up with the latest social trends. She wants you to be a surgeon. Star is expressly adamant that the high-risk surgery is performed, which is weird to say the least. We head up to the newly unlocked mountain area and head into the operating room. There, we give the operation of our life. Once the surgery is complete, we head down to the beach and Star looks the same. You question her on the meaning of this and she reveals that Joe was performing surgery to turn her rival into a monster. Now whether the player did the high-risk surgery or the low-risk surgery will determine the ending to the MV storyline. Both look crazy as one includes a pirate peg leg, the other a surgically implanted mohawk. And you won't believe which surgery leads to which. The low-risk surgery will result in a massive boom in followers for Star's competitor. The high-risk surgery will give a massive boom to Star's. While up in the mountains, Crosley will ask if we can hunt the elusive snow fox. Directly to the right of Crosley is the said snow fox. Easy one-hit KO, and we head back home. Day 16. Dominating the side quest game, we pay our bills like we do every morning before even starting the jobs. Lawrence and his creepy obsession with Sally have gotten to a climax, and unfortunately, we're about to see that unfold. He tells us he's invited Sally to a romantic overlook near the hospital. Once we arrive on scene, Lawrence conveys his feelings to Sally. Sally knows Lawrence as her stalker. Now Joe has a choice to make. He can side with Lawrence or beat the shit out of him and profusely apologize to Sally for just everything. If you side with Sally, she'll leave a muffin every day outside the coffee shop. If you side with Lawrence, he pulls out a gun and shoots her. I thought he'd shoot himself after, but he doesn't and says he just didn't want anyone else to have her. Thus concludes the Lust storyline. Uh, yeah, do I really need to explain the good and bad endings on some of these? Uh, yeah, good ending, Sally lives. We head over to the mayor's office to rub in his face that his approval ratings are in the gutter. The mayor informs us he's aware of the situation and requires us to change that. Our task is to head over to the election booth, break in, and see that he wins. You got your job to Watergate this bitch, so you head over there and knock out the cop guarding the door, or bribe him. You make your way in. You can then start loading up ballots in either the mayor or the opposing candidate's favor, the apparent good and bad endings. Once finalizing the vote, you can pretty much count the greed storyline as over. Head home as this has been a very busy day, and we just completed day 16. Day 17. Wednesday. Getting closer to the end, we begin to run around doing cleanup jobs. First, Crosley, he wants us to take out a polar bear, which I did in one hit with a well-timed bat swing. Then, I did the final and fourth treasure hunt, where I went to the hospital's pond to locate it. Upon returning the treasure to the farmer, he finds out it was his father's watch. He thinks it's junk and gives it to you. Dickhead. Along your playthrough, you could have talked to a man every day on the dock who would have a story about perseverance. I also spent my day collecting all the pages for the author mentioned earlier in this video. There are 30 in all, and I link a guide on where to find them in the description. Day 18. Technically your last full day before you have to go meet your employer, Delroy. You run around pretty much just killing time. With the opening of the mountain area, you could go play around as a doctor, or work a fast food shift per usual. But if you did everything as soon as you got it, there's only one job available, Crosley. Crosley, on your last night with your family, would like you to go out to the lake after dark and find a cryptid. I did this, cause why not? I had full family stats and was good on money. So I go out there, and it's a reskinned robber with faster walking speeds. You kill him and a wolf with a baseball bat swing and go back to Crosley, who profuses that this is the missing evolutionary link and a scientific breakthrough. You head home for the night as you've been hard at work, going to bed in a town that is significantly better or worse depending on your actions. Day 19, Friday, our last Friday to be exact. Bruce says there's no job but to report at Delroy's hideout before midnight. I wonder where that is. I went immediately, ready to end my three hour playthrough. Each playthrough is three hours every time, possibly longer depending on your perks. 
walking into Delroy's with gusto because there's no turning back after this point. Now check this. We beat the game. Like, this is the end. But also check this. There are four endings. So here's how they go. Walking into the cave with the big inconspicuous vault door securing the front, we're shown a mini diorama of the town, even down to the detail of the word you put as the sign. Delroy says, wow, look at what a great impact you had, or wow, look at what a bad impact you had, or wow, look at the no impact you had. Moving on, you walk down the stairs leading down further into the Legion of Doom's base. The next room is a hexagon with doors on each side of the room. Inside these chambers are the embodiments of sin Joe encounters throughout the game. If they manage to dupe you into the villainy, then they get to sit out for this part. If you stuck to the straight and narrow while dealing with these folks, they will be present. A quick recap of who's who for those of us who need reminders, Bert is pride, Star is envy, the mayor is greed, the sheriff is gluttony, Lawrence is lust, Kyle is sloth, and we'll get to wrath in a second. Assuming you went full good guy here, here's what happens to each person. Starting with the mayor. In the mayor's torture chamber, you will find him standing in a clear cube. Once you press the button fixed in front of the cube, it will begin to slowly fill up with cash, suffocating the man. Moving on. Next is Star. Star is trapped inside a clear cylinder. Your task here is to delete all of her social media. Seems a little light, but whatever. Our next roster candidate is Kyle. Kyle's punishment involves us permanently sealing his hands and feet in quick drying cement, never to lift a finger again. Our former coworker Bert is about to have his prideful image shattered as Joe boots up TV cameras of Bert in jail. To me, it just looks like Bert was kidnapped, but that's showbiz, I guess. Time to cook a fine meal with this next one, the sheriff. The sheriff, a convicted cannibal, finds his shoe on the other foot. Placed in a large cooking pot, we must roast the sheriff by turning on the burners. Loverboy Lawrence is in a large cube like the mayor, but all around him are televisions. By turning the televisions on, Lawrence is forced to watch every rejection he's experienced over and over. If you went full evil, none of these rooms will be open, and you'll be able to proceed without any of the things I just described. This concludes all of the torture in this room. So we move on to the next, heading down even further, with more stairs, we enter a familiar room. This is where we shot Bobby a few weeks ago, but things are different now. Bruce is on the other side, and there's a gun. If you're doing a full devil run, kill Bruce. Doing a full angel run, don't kill Bruce, and shoot the lock. If you kill Bruce, you get an achievement saying that Bruce was the seventh, implying that Bruce was the embodiment of wrath. Delroy is pleased with our evilness or astounded we didn't take revenge. We enter the final hallway, where Delroy says the iconic line, Remember Joe, you deserve this. When we enter the room, there's a coffin. Opening the coffin will reveal your ending. There are four in total as you remember me saying. The Devil Ending The Devil Ending has you being an absolute bastard your entire playthrough, making insane amounts of money by drug dealing, killing for hire, and completing all jobs in the most sinister way. By far the most fun and rewarding. At the end of the Devil Run, it's revealed Delroy needs a new Bruce, so to say, in your prime real estate. Becoming the new incarnate of Wrath, you and Delroy rule with an iron hand. The Angel Ending By being an absolute metagame god and ruining the plans of all embodiments, you will receive the Angel Ending. No, you don't become an angel like in the Devil Ending, but instead, life goes on as it should. You grow old with your family and Maggie moves on from Bobby, remarrying. You know Delroy is gone, but sometimes feel as if someone is watching you. Good karma ending. These next two endings are based on your karma and your completion status of each job. Having mixed results or incomplete storylines will result in these endings. Opening the coffin reveals Maggie, Bobby's wife. Delroy says you were good, but not good enough, and it's a shame. Maggie is buried with Bobby, and you visit sometimes. The guilt never really left you. Bad karma ending. This will be our final and by far worst ending. To get the bad karma ending, i.e. just doing everything with good karma ending, incomplete storylines, mixed results. Opening the coffin reveals your spouse. Delroy says by not picking a lane, you've given up everything. You were never going to save your family anyways. Delroy says you've shown weakness, which is why he's ending your bloodline here. Uh, the room fills with fire. Our kid becomes immediately homeless and presumably dies. Maggie mourns Bobby for years and deep down secretly knew it was you. So yeah, that, that's, the, the, that's the bad ending. Family Man is an interesting dive into the, the games from No More Robots, the developer of this title. It's currently on sale for 75% off. 
I know I gave you the rundown of the plot and how to get each ending, but there's still a lot to experience for yourself, as I didn't cover everything. If you enjoyed this breakdown of the game, maybe hit that like and subscribe button. I post shorts daily and live streams regularly enough to care. So, yeah. Peace out. Thank you for watching. If you watched, this was a long one. Also, I'd like to announce my merch. I don't know if people... I've announced it before. I have merch. It's in, my, it's in my link bio. People are often wondering how they can support me. I would love for people to, you know, rock my gear. So that'd be really cool. Uh, there's other videos. I made a cool Road 92 video that I think most people would enjoy if you enjoyed this one. Uh, yeah, yeah. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for my recent subscribers. Thank you, uh, Seb. Thank you, uh, uh, Soli. Thank you, Kaylee my beautiful girlfriend for supporting me. Thank you, Baca. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, uh, thank you everyone. If I forgot you, thank you. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. End video now.